morning, Charged Up Studio listeners. I am glad to have you here once again with us. Once again, this is Dana Olivo with your host and CEO of Marketatomy LLC. Today, we have an exciting program for you that is guaranteed to open your eyes to how to reach your ideal customer and why they choose the products and services that they buy. Michael literally wrote the book on understanding consumers. Literally, I mean, hundreds of thousands of business students have learned about marketing from his books, including consumer behavior, buying, having, and being the most widely used book on the subject in the world. In fact, I think this might have been one of the books that I was required to read (laughs) when I was going for my marketing degree. (laughs) His mantra is, we don't buy products because of what they do. We buy them because of what they mean. And we'll get into more of that as we continue on. He advises global clients in leading industries such as apparel and footwear as well for well-known brands like Calvin Klein, Levi Strauss, Under Armour, Timberland, also other name brands such as eBay, Philadelphia Eagles, DuPont, and many, many more on marketing strategies to make them more consumer-centric. A well-thought-after public speaker, Michael, has delivered keynotes to a wide variety of industry professionals. He is passionate about the extraordinary world of the ordinary consumer. Let's all welcome Mr. Michael Solomon to our little show. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, my goodness. With your background, I'm envious here. (laughs) (laughs) You've worked some very large brands here. Yeah. You know, so you've got a lot of experience, and I'm sure you have a lot that you could share with our listeners here. Do my Um, best. Today's... Yes, today's podcast is going to be talking about the consumer buying behavior and the science behind it. Well, I must say, I'm really excited to learn more about consumer behavior from you. So um, before we get started, can I ask you one personal question to gain some insight into who you are? Absolutely. Okay. What is your why? What got you started on this journey of educating others on consumer behavior. Why do you do it? Yeah, well, you know, that's a, uh, I, I'm not sure I have the whole answer. It's been 40 years of doing it. I guess I had a reason, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess really the why is that I, I, I realized early on as a, as a social scientist that that a lot of the everyday stuff that we do and we take for granted, you know, we go to the store, we try things on, we go out, somewhere or other and we want to look our best whatever the situation there's an incredible amount of meaning and emotion wrapped up in those decisions and it's you know so it's not just the really big decision should i should i buy this luxury car or that one or this house or that one and those are important too but but the everyday decisions that we make, there's so much beneath the surface that we don't understand. And I guess my, my mission as a, as a social psychologist is, has been to study that, to help companies understand the stuff that's going on, to, you know, that their brands are a lot more than just some letters on a logo or something like that. And it's, it's really about our, our daily lives and how we use products and services literally to decide who we are. Very interesting. I do a lot of um, uh, uh, coaching, consulting on the customer journey process. And when you start talking about the science and what's going through their heads when they're making their decisions and things like that, we as as, as marketers need to understand and be able to put ourselves in their shoes so that at every touch point, we are responding to what their what their expectations are at every touch point. And that's difficult to do sometimes. Yes. You know, so you say in your new book that we don't buy things because of what they do. We buy them because of what they mean. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. You know, it's uh, what got me fascinated about studying brands and consumer behavior is, is that so much of these, uh, uh, of these brands really the 
the successful brands at least are, have a story behind them. You know, they're not just some some object that that we use. They they have a story. They have there's a lot of symbolism wrapped up in these brands, and good marketers know this, and they try to uh, you know maximize the value of their brand, but. But too often, a lot of marketers fall into this trap of thinking that the customers want to buy what they make. And that's not quite true. You know, they want to buy. In other words, uh, you, you make certain features. You know, you, you, you can talk about how your product has certain technical specifications that are better than the other guys and so on. But, but at the end of the day, when we buy something, that's only part of the equation. And so much of it has to do with how that product or service really kind of resonates with who we are, perhaps who we want to be, the different identities that we are pursuing. And so um, it's really kind of a mistake, you know, to focus on when we talk about attributes versus benefits. And I teach my students this probably in the first week of class, you know, uh, we're, Marketers make attributes, you know, make product features, but customers buy benefits. We buy what is that going to do for me? So if you focus too much on having the best widget, you know, and increasing, I don't know, revolutions per minute or whatever, you know, whatever the tech is, you're probably going to lose sight of what your customers really are looking for. So by just accepting that kind of transition from attributes to, to benefits, um, Strategically, I think whether you're a, a new business or an old one, you know, small or big, that opens the door to really understanding what your brand more broadly means to people. And there are so many examples we could get into of successful products that have done that, you know, everything from, let's say, Starbucks coffee, you know, the usual suspects, uh, Apple computers, Nike, Lululemon, and uh, Ford Mustang, and, and on and on. Um, these brands are successful, not because, you know, for example, you're paying your, you just have to have that $5 cup of coffee, you know, but you're right. obviously buying that experience, and maybe that's worth $5 to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. So what is the single biggest obstacle marketers face today in terms of connecting with the customer? I think the single biggest issue is, is a very simple one. Um, you know, it's not creating some incredibly sophisticated marketing campaign or, uh, you know, improving your SEO or something like those are important, you know, but it really is just getting your customer's attention. You know, the fact is that we, we live in a world of a, kind of an information tsunami. You know, everybody, oh, as you know, is, uh, you know, walking around with their heads in their phones and we're constantly being distracted. Um, you know, the average, the average adult in, in the U.S. today is exposed to, if you can believe this, uh, over 3,500 pieces of, of marketing information every single day. From all these different places doesn't mean we're paying attention to all those, by the way. So the most crucial initial challenge is just to get through that clutter and get that person to sit up, maybe look up from their phone or maybe look down at their phone, depending on where you are, and just to get them to to marshal enough of their attention so that they're not looking at pop up ads or chasing, chasing their Facebook updates and so on, but they're just listening to what you have to say. Believe it or not, that is, the, if, if you can pass that hurdle, and it ain't easy, I've got news for oh, you, it's not. you are halfway home. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I can tell you that with, with my business, which is dealing with solo and micro entrepreneurs, the, the connection that I make with them is because I've failed in business twice before. I know exactly what they're going through, what their expectations are, what they're fighting. And that's where I think where you're going with this is, is we have to understand who the customer is. Put yourself in their shoes and anticipate what those expectations are. Um, just because you have, you know, um, you know, with Apple, let's take Apple computers, for, for example. OK, I'm a big Apple advocate. Um, because I'm a graphic designer by nature, you know, and I deal with a lot of graphics, videos, things like that. And I get frustrated with PCs when they freeze up on me all the time. Right. 
<laughs> so there's a reason. And I and, and so my expectations when I'm doing this is I need to be able to open a bunch of windows and be able to work seamlessly, you know, and things like that. Um, and I think that's where Apple came in with their processing system and meeting those expectations. That and the fact that it's very user friendly from the time it was introduced, very user friendly because a lot of people don't understand the DOS system and, you know, and all this other stuff. So, um, so what are some of the strategies a business can use to engage its customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, you know, there are, there are ways to do it. There's lots of different ways. The important thing is to do it, but to, but to choose a path. Um, I'm actually developing a course on this right now, an online course on ramping up engagement because it's so crucial. And the research shows clearly that if you can engage your customers, your, your profitability will actually go up uh, significantly. So the, the key is, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? And, uh, you know, there, there are several strategies, um, but what they all boil down to is relevance, right? Is, is finding ways to make what, what you are selling more relevant to that individual. And again, when I say relevant, I don't mean that, you know, they need a, a uh, three quarter inch drill bit rather than a half inch drill bit. You know, I'm, when I say relevant, I'm saying, how does that offering connect to me and, and things I'm trying to do in my life? So uh, one way to do that is wherever possible to personalize or customize the product or service. Um, because we know that you know people we all we all love to be spoken to right as an individual not just as some one of the masses you know and so whenever you can make a person feel that this this product or service has been tweaked to fit my needs and maybe i've actually had some input into that process then you're ramping up an engagement right there Right. Um, and, and actually for, you know, for very small business people, that's kind of where you have an advantage sometimes, you know, the, the big guys have all the resources, you know, they have the big guns and everything, but they're like on a battleship or an aircraft carrier. And, you know, it takes forever to turn that thing around. Now, if you're, if you're the little guy, uh, you know, you can, you can have a much more personal connection probably with your customers. And that's a big advantage. So you should, you know, you should do whatever you can to exploit that advantage by connecting with those customers individually, if possible, whether in an automated fashion, you know, using say email software or CRM system, or if you have a small store or business, you know, uh, just just keeping a file card with your customer's name right. on it and what they like. I'm, I'm often amazed how many businesses don't even bother to do that. Or if they do, they don't bother to use that data. I mean, it's sitting right there. And so that's a great example of a way to ramp up engagement. You know, there are others we could talk about. For example, gamification is, is very popular these days, turning, uh, turning the process of obtaining, you know, the item in, into a game and making it uh, making it more relevant because it, it shares the characteristics of games. Uh, basically, anything that, that you can do that shows the person this is not a cookie cutter offering. You know, this is something that that I can customize for you because you're very important. And whenever people think we're important, they immediately have a way of getting our attention. Right. Exactly. And this is a fluid status. OK, this is not something in consumer be buying behaviors. They change regularly. You can't get set in one mode of meeting and, and not expect it to change. And part of what we teach through our customer journey process is staying in touch of the trends that are changing out there in the market with our consumers. Yeah. That's, what can you, know, you that, say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's such, it's such a crucial point. And, you know, uh, the problem is that, that, you know, there's this mindset that, well, I've done, I've connected the dots. I've, I did what I had to do. I can check that box. And now I'm good for life. And <laughs> the marketing graveyard is filled with, with products that had that kind of hubris, you know, that kind of, well, I'm great. No one can touch me. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, big companies. So, so let's take an example, the Sony Walkman. You probably remember it. I remember it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, you know, my students have almost no idea what that is. Be and why is that? Because they focused on the attributes rather than the benefits, right? They, 
they created this notion of, you know, mobile music. They really invented that. Um, and they focused on, you know, doing it. And we remember those cassettes that you put in there and all that. Right. You know, the, so they, they nailed the benefit before years before anybody else came even to the party. But they didn't nail the idea that there might be eventually other companies come along with entirely new technologies that will provide the same experience. So today, if I want to, you know, have a device that allows me to listen to music, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, if Walkmans are even sold anymore. Maybe they no, are, but, no. but I doubt I'm going to buy one, you know, uh, even though they invented that benefit. It was such a huge, they were light years ahead of the competition. And now the Walkman is in the marketing graveyard because Apple and other companies figured out that that now we can, you know, we can stream that right. music. We don't yeah. have to have it on a hard device. Exactly. Exactly. So you state in your new book that, the familiar mass market segmentation strategies many companies have traditionally used for a long time are no longer relevant in a postmodern consumer culture. What does that mean? I think we've started talking a little bit about that, but what do you mean by that statement? Yeah, well, postmodern is a long is a long kind of academic word, but basically what it means is that uh, we're we live in a culture that has moved beyond set boundaries uh, where things are very tidy, you know, everything is put in little boxes and we, by putting in a box, we think we understand it. And, and that goes for our lifestyles, right? The mm -hmm. ways that we spend our, our time and, and money. So if you think about it back in the old days, you know, let's, let's talk about the 1960s, you know, we lived in a broadcasting society, which was a great innovation. So we could reach anybody in the United States pretty much on any one of, let's say, three networks, TV mm -hmm. networks. Now you fast forward to today and it's no longer possible to put everybody in these massive boxes, which is what we were taught in Marketing 101 about segmentation, right? We find these large homogeneous groups and we market to everybody in that group the same way. You know, women in their 30s who are affluent, they live in a in a metropolitan area, they like to play tennis on the weekends, whatever, whatever it is. Well, you find two women who fit those descriptors and you say to them, are you both identical? And I, I think you're going to get some dirty looks because they're clearly not. And and so today's, uh, you know, today's society, we talk about narrow casting, for example. We no longer have just those those big TV networks. Who knows if we'll even have those in a few years? But, you know, today we're literally, our biggest problem is we have too much choice. You know, which of the thousands of cable stations am I going to watch or websites I'm going to go to, et cetera. So uh, there are very specialized buckets of content for very, very specialized activities, whether they're hobbies or, you know, things, sports we saw in the Olympics that we didn't even know were sports, but I guess someone's been doing them, you know, synchronized diving or something. Uh, you know, that that's a post postmodern kind of phenomenon. And so the best way for, for your uh, viewers to think about this is that in the old days, you would, you would decide that, you know, you're going to go out for dinner, you can have Italian food. And so you go to a restaurant that's clearly labeled as Italian. And you can pretty much expect a similar experience, whichever one of those restaurants you go to. Now, today, or at least before COVID, when we had buffets, you know, we have yeah. these huge international buffets that people love, right? And so there you're on your on your plate, you know, you're putting you're putting spaghetti and meatballs and maybe tacos and maybe, you know, maybe egg food Chicken wings it, and stuff like know, that. All the different <laughs> things you're, you're mixing and matching. And that's the way we like to live today. And we're able to do it largely because of technology. We're able to access so many more different lifestyles and, you know, visions about how people are living their lives that we, each of us are kind of a, like a unique artist that's, that's picking and choosing from all these places and creating our, our own unique lifestyle. And so I call these people, and I titled my book, The New Chameleons. And so a chameleon, as you know, changes colors in mm -hmm. response to external changes. You know, it can be changing constantly. And that's what most consumers are doing today. They're changing their identities often several times during a day, you know, maybe they're uh, in the morning, they're a, they're a mom or a dad, and maybe, maybe they're a business owner, and maybe they're a parachute 
jumper and, you know, maybe they're a football fan and, and on and on, um, you know, and, and so it's very difficult today in what we call this fragmented culture mm-hmm. to, to find lots of people who share the same characteristics. So uh, this is one of the reasons I think that, that uh, technologies that I'm sure you talk about, like SEO and so on, you know, online search are so important because what they're saying is the best predictor of future behavior is, is not whether you're 30 years old and a, and a woman, but what did you buy last week? So the best predictor of future behavior is actually past behavior. Now, is it perfect? Definitely not. No. But you're going to get a lot closer. And so when when you think about all of their, well, it gets kind of creepy, you know, when you're, you know, you're searching for home theater systems and uh, 10 minutes later, ads for home theater systems magically pop up on on your screen. We've all had that experience. There are some privacy issues there that are very troubling. But from a purely functional perspective, what that means is that you're serving me up what I'm looking for based Mm -hmm. on what I was just looking for. Right. And so that's a different way to think about really what we uh, some people call this markets of one. Every one of your customers, in a sense, is his or her own market. Now, do they share similarities with others? Of course they do. But nobody wants to be part, you know, marketed to as part of a big market. We all want to be dealt with as individuals. That's true whether you're dealing face to face with salespeople who you don't want reading from a script, you know, dear sir or madam, thank you for your business. Right. <laughs> nobody right. wants that. And so let's right. stop, let's stop, you know, that kind of cookie cutter approach and acknowledge that today. People want to be individuals, and increasingly, we have the ability, even if we're the small guys without too many resources, we do have the ability, at least in a limited way, to relate to every one of our customers as an individual. Exactly. So really, segmentation according to attributes and and things like that is pretty much gone by the wayside when you think about this. You know, there's still segmentation, but it's more on cultural and, 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 um, um, culture, moral psychographics, you know, psychographics is often what it's called, but, but we're even going because there that, you know, that's still broad-based segmentation, you know, let's reach everybody who's introverted or everybody who likes to join clubs. Well, not everybody who likes to join clubs is the same person. So I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater, by the way, I'm not saying don't segment at all, but don't think, that just because you've, you know, you've identified an audience of, like I was saying, you know, women in their 30s or what have you, that that everybody in that group is, is going to be the same. So you may not want to deal with, I don't know, men in their 70s for what you're selling. Right. Although, you know, again, today it, it's surprising what people buy that may or may not be appropriate for them. <laughs> well, and it's funny that we're talking about this because then when we get over to the digital marketing side and social media and things like that a great deal of the um, selecting who you're going to go after with your digital marketing is based on this segmentation, you know? Um, And so that would, that would stand a reason why um, perhaps a lot of your, your digital marketing are not on target, you Mm -hmm. know, and you don't get the results. Now, granted the content has to speak to whoever that is. But to segment who it appears before is is difficult to predict when you're talking about digital marketing. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, it can be a good first step, but you you may still want to tweak it, you know. So, for example, if you're doing Facebook ads, you know, I know one common practice is you kind of come up with your ideal customer, you know, a persona of that customer, and then you create so-called mirror advertising where you specify those characteristics and look for other people like that. And that's a, that's a great first step, but that doesn't mean that everybody that Facebook or one of the other platforms identifies is exactly the same as the person you started with, who, which was probably not a real person to begin with, was probably, you know, came out of the minds of your creative people or something. Exactly. Like wow. Being driven <laughs> by the data, you know, and, and when we talk about expectations, you know, the problem is that, uh, that ironically, a lot of marketing managers, when they think about their customer, 
don't have a realistic view of even who that customer is. They know who they're, they want their customer to be, and that's who they think of. It's often a projection of themselves, by the way, and what they would like. And you, well, you may get lucky, yeah. you, you know, you may get lucky and your customers are like yourself, but it's, it's probable, it's probable that they're not. And so imposing right. your own desires and expectations can often lead you down a blind alley. That's, that's really a mistake. And I find I do that to a degree because, like I said, I've been there, done that, you know, as far as um, small business, you know, solo and micro entrepreneurs, you know, and and who I consider to be my target audience. You know, I'm I'm automatically um, grouping two different groups, you know, one of which are those adults coming out of corporate America who are um, realizing look, I'm not going to be able to afford to support myself when I retire, you know, so automatically assuming that those are going, they're going to start their own side hustle or something is also taking, making an assumption there. It's what I would do. Yeah. It's what I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's what I did realizing I'm not going to be able to support myself on my retirement, you know, yeah. um, but making those assumptions is, is another thing. The other thing is, is um, going after those um, stay at home moms or or dads or whatever, you know, those who are um, raising children, young families, you know, and things like that and staying at home and assuming that that's one of my markets as well. So I find that I am constantly having to revisit who is my avatar. Yeah, Who and, am I and you should to... be. Not yeah. only should you do that, but you should, you know, you might have multiple avatars because again, we, you know, as chameleons, we, we're not the same all the time. And so, uh, you know, if you have, let's say a corporate buyer, you know, and, and a B2B kind of, you know, persona, uh, what is that person doing on their, on their time off? Well, we, we don't right. really know that, you know? <laughs> so right. we, yeah, we definitely, you know, you, you certainly want to keep that in mind that, uh, that you have your, your customer is a changing target. And, and furthermore, you know, to what you were saying, sometimes you might, you might actually miss some potential customers because you're assuming that they're, that they're not interested, you know, uh, uh, to give you an example of this, I, I do a lot of work with uh, direct selling companies, you know, like uh, Mary Kay and Amway and, and, and things like that, where you have these, uh, you know, independent distributors, and maybe maybe that overlaps with some of the people that you talk about in your community. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and, and one thing we know, we know about direct selling is that it's overwhelmingly female. So it's 90, you know, something like 90% of the distributors are women. Well, that, you know, that's great. But what that also means is 10% of Many millions of people who participate in that industry are men. men. Yeah, nobody. I've met, I've, I've met a male Avon <laughs> representative. So. Yeah, yeah, you don't you and, don't see and, him too often, but you know the industry. Yeah, and he's even me. better than some of the women I've seen. Yeah, you know, yeah. so <laughs> you know, but, that's exactly but, but, it. Yeah, so sometimes there are you know, especially if you're a small business, you know, you don't want to go after the you know the big the big target, you go after the, the, the stuff that the other guys have left behind, you know, the low hanging fruit, because they're, they're not interested or, or able to go after, let's say those male direct selling distributors, you know, and so maybe there's an opportunity for you. Right. You know, and, and also as a strategist, I'm always looking ahead at where things are changing, where things are going. And in particular, right now with COVID and what's going on with COVID, and the fact that a lot of your corporations are moving towards a mandatory um, uh, immunization before you can come back into the office. You know, what I see happening down the road is a lot of those who are not, who are anti-immunization, basically just saying, hell, no, I'm not coming back to work. I'll just, you know, start my own business or, you know, do some or, or work remotely in the gig economy, you know, and, and so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what, what does that lead to? Where, where will we go with that new way of thinking, hmm. you know, down the road? And we have to be thinking about that. And how can we reach those individuals? 
Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting uh, point. You know, I hadn't thought of that really. Uh, you know, I suppose there's I don't know what the percentage will be. I hope it's a low one. I don't want to get into politics, but um, you know, whatever that it's like I was saying with the 90 to 10 and direct selling. I mean, if yeah. you know, if five percent of the of the population doesn't get vaccinated in a year, let's say, that's that probably translates into a few million people who are looking for something to do where they don't have contact with others. Exactly. So go exactly. for it. <laughs> I mean, I understand why corporations are doing this, but you know. Again, to force people is taking away their civil rights, you know, their 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 liberties here. But anyway, um, let's move on. <laughs> so you show how several fundamental assumptions we make about labeling customers are no longer valid. You describe a series of basic dichotomies we apply routinely that no other that no longer exist. Um, one of these is the distinction we make between offline versus online. What is what is that no longer, why is that no longer relevant? Yeah, well, you know, that actually is related to what, to your point about people yes. going, going online, right? So, you know, back in, back in the day, 10 years ago, I don't know, uh, you know, everybody was debating, well, first they were debating, do I go online? Let's say I'm a retailer. Uh, or a small business? Do I go online? And if so, you know, how much of my budget do I devote to that versus offline? You know, and then, and then it got to the point where, and especially after COVID, we say, do we even need the offline, or should we go totally online? Um, today, the that is is that's a, that's an example of a false dichotomy where we assume you're either offline or online. Now, the reality is, and, and if, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to teach college students, you'll really understand this, but I think everybody will get it anyway. Most people today, especially younger ones, are simultaneously offline and online pretty much all day and all night. So when I have a student and I'm, you know, I'm lecturing to that student in a classroom and they're hopefully listening to me out of one ear, at least, I'll, I'll settle for that. But at the same time, they're checking whether their girlfriend broke up with them on Facebook. They are simultaneously online and offline. And when when it comes to shopping, it's the same thing. Again, especially younger people are, you know, they, these people grew up. These are digital natives who grew up playing video games. That's the way they interact with other people. And so th this idea, you know, should I have an online strategy should I have an offline strategy? These are questions that we should not even be asking because, you know, we hear a lot of talk about omni-channel marketing. And what that means is being uh, kind of medium agnostic, that is being everywhere that's feasible where you think your customers are going to be. So, for example, if I, if I know my customers are college students, well, I'm not going to take out, out an ad in a newspaper because no college student ever reads a newspaper, uh, but I might consider putting some resources into the local bar that has a closed circuit TV and runs ads, you know, for local merchants, because I know that's where those customers are going to be. So omni-channel means just whatever works best, whether it's offline or online. And that's true in a bricks and mortars, uh, mortar store, by the way where you still need to have a lot of, you need to have a hybrid experience. Right. Uh, same way with the meetings industry. When, when right. people are going to meetings now, you know, I, I for my own, I, you know, I love to keynote at, at meetings in person and talk to a thousand people, um, but I'm probably not going to be doing that as much going down the road because I'm, I'm just as likely to be piped in on a computer screen, mm -hmm. which saves a lot of time and money, et, et cetera. Right. But on the other hand, people don't want to give up in-person meetings because the real magic, as we know, happens in the hallways, not in the in the session rooms. Right. So increasingly, you know, and, and we could go on and on healthcare, you know, a lot of different things. We're going to see this merger where more and more online technology will show up in places where we're used to just being uh, there in person. Right, right. No, I, I fully agree. Even if you are on stage, you may be uh, being filmed and streamed as well. So, Absolutely. you know, um, yeah, and I've, I've done a few of them like that as well. So similarly, you describe the blurring of the lines between producers 
and consumers. Why does that matter? Yeah, that, this, this blurring is a huge change in, in marketing. When people ask me, what's, what's the biggest change you've seen in the last 20 years, either before or after COVID, my, my answer is the proactivity of customers. That is, in the old days, again, we have this model in our heads where you make something or you buy something, and there's no convergence between the two. I'm, I'm either the maker or I'm the buyer. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see today is that many, first of all, that that smart companies, and I, I talk about this uh, a lot uh, in, in keynotes, uh, companies that allow consumers to co-create with them, that is allowing them in to what used to be a sacred space where no one else was allowed to go. That is a product that has not yet been launched because it still has bugs in it. It used to be that never you'd never want a customer to see it until it's perfect. But today, everything's in beta. You know, this originated originated with software coding, where you get your users to go through lines of code, kind of tedious, to to identify mistakes before you you launch the code. Now, in the same way, we have everyday consumers who are taking on roles of business people that they never used to do. I, uh, I mentioned direct selling before. I'm, I'm intrigued by that because everyday people, you know, very often, uh, you know, uh, younger women, for example, around the world are, are, are opening a business when they have zero experience with any aspect of business, whether it's inventory or promotion or what have you. But now they've become business people. Similarly, of course, we talk about the gig economy, which is a part of what I'm referring to. Right. We have, think about it, we have everyday people who are going into the hotel business, the taxi cab business, and, and on and Uber. on. <laughs> uh, and so, again, everyday people are doing this stuff. We have everyday people in, in the area of promotion. So many of the ads that, that we see have actually been created or submitted or suggested by everyday people. When you think about for example, the Doritos campaign that ran on the Super Bowl for 10 years where, uh, you know, everyday people submitted an ad for the product. Uh, you know, those those commercials usually were made for a budget of under one hundred dollars for every year that those were on. They were among the most effective Super Bowl ads of all those shown and, and all the others, as you know, that's where the agencies, you know, showcase their best work. So. Consumers are getting everything, you know, they're doing everything. And, and again, producers who get that, a lot of them don't get it. You know, they want to push these people away. Apple is famous for that. Won't release anything. You know, often the sketches get left at a bar or something like that. <laughs> but, um, but other companies like, say, Lego, for example, one of, my, one of my favorite examples, because they were really on the ropes at one point, and then they started to transform their, their philosophy one of the things they did was to open things up and create a community. I think they have over 10,000 users of Legos who actually suggest new product ideas to the company and they get compensated yeah. if those are successful. So no matter what your vertical, you can eliminate that boundary between the producer and the consumer. And my point is that you often want to do that. And again, right. when you asked me before about how do we ramp up engagement, man, there's nothing that does that like being asked by your favorite company, what changes would you make if we were to come out with the next version? You know, what would you do? You know, here's product right. by Dana 2.0. Mm -hmm. There's nothing much going to ramp up your engagement. You know, that that is well, huge. So, yeah. And, and in all honesty, it's those individuals that Market Atomy was developed for. Those ones that have gone into business with no experience whatsoever, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, that's that's who we serve. So you talk about flesh versus machines and merging of those. I'm interested in what you mean by that. You know, that's one of my favorite dichotomies that no longer yeah. exists. F flesh versus machine. So we've always made a distinction uh, between, you know, the, our bodies, our, ourselves, and first of all, you know, anything external to us, but certainly machines. So today we have robots, we have Androids, we have Siri, we have all, you know, AI, all of these things going on. Increasingly, these things are being incorporated into our physical body. So 
you know, many of your listeners probably have technology implanted in their bodies. You know, it can be a pacemaker, it could be contact lenses, it can be an artificial hip, many, many different things. And maybe they've had silicon implants to look better. There's lots of different ways that technology is actually be, is merging into our bodies. And, and what that means is that increasingly we're becoming like what we call cyborgs, which is part human and part machine. And when you look at some of the androids that are being created today, uh, for example, there is a, an android, uh, a woman, she was actually intended to look like Catherine Hepburn. I'm not sure if they succeeded, but she's very realistic looking. Um, she was made uh, an official citizen of Saudi Arabia. So she's the first robot or android to become a citizen of a country. Wow. We're going to be seeing this more and more and the integration of robots into our lives more generally. Let's say you're in the healthcare business, you know, caregivers, uh, as you know, that's a huge problem, burnout, fine for right. you know, about 25% of American adults are caregivers. And so uh, the market for caregiving ro assistive robots who can live with older people or people who have disabilities is enormous. And that's just one small vertical. Right. Right. No. And, and it's it's right. You know, you're tr you're absolutely right. Um, and when you think about it, also, when we're talking about flesh versus machines, the first thing I think about is systems and processes put in place that may replace human interaction. You know, I, that, that's another way of my thinking about it. But, you know, with implantations, which, you know, uh, may be controlled by a computer and you can hack those implantations, you know, such as a heart monitor or something like that, um, that gets scary too. You know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a brave new world for, it for is. sure. But, it but is. you know what, if we, if we stick our heads in the sand and, and you know, it's coming. So we, okay. we've got to deal with it. You know, you're, there are obviously policy issues about, you know, employment and, you know, for example, today, I don't think you want to become a truck driver because, you know, within five years, you'll, your job will be dead, you know, from uh, self-driving trucks. And, and even in the marketing industry itself, as, as I'm sure you know, there's an awful lot of automation that's going on where oh, yeah. some marketing jobs already are being replaced by right. AI, and that's only going to continue. So when you, when you think about the thousands of people who are employed at call centers, for better or worse... Uh, we we now have chatbots that are doing the exact same thing. And I hate to say it, they're often doing it better. Right, right. No, exactly. So this, this next question really intrigues me because I want to hear what you have to say about it. Okay, you devote a whole chapter to um, the male-female dichotomy. Okay, and I'm, I'm studying this right now. So this is very much of interest to me especially when it comes to speaking and confronting your consumer. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So that you, you talk about a longstanding dichotomy that's no longer relevant, uh, mm -hmm. male, female, pick one or the other. You can't be both, you can't be neither. Uh, we, all, we know there have always been exceptions to that, but we never have thought about it that much. But today, we don't even have those endpoints. You know, when you when you look at what young people are thinking and talking about, what you know, we hear so much about the fluidity of gender. And we talk about that this idea of that of binary genderism going away. And that's exactly what that means, of everybody having to make a choice. Uh, you know, to people of our generation, it just seems natural to do that, even if even though you never were, maybe you weren't the perfect fit, you know. Uh, you may, you tried to fit yourself into that little cookie cutter image of what it means to be male or female. Today, they're not even trying. You know, the, the uh, young people, we see all this usage of, of different pronouns that, that people have. Uh, we see in, in fashion, we see androgynous fashion, we see unisex fashions. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, I was talking before about overlooked markets. So one of the one of the exciting things about this, and, and it, look, it can often be unsettling for, especially for older traditional people to think about this. But right. if let's say if you're selling a product, let's say for women, let you know, uh, and you've always assumed that your customers had to be female, 
that may not be the case today. So let's say you make, uh, you know, bracelets or you make uh, bags, you know. So today we have, you know, men wear bracelets, men carry man bags or nurses or whatever people want to call them. Um, I carry one very often. It's just, I said, hey, women figured this out years ago. Why didn't I know about this, you know? Uh, but the point is that, you know, it, it, now if a certain percentage of men are customers for these products, you're, you're missing the boat, you know? Uh, cosmetics, believe it or not. Men wear them. In, in some countries, you know, in the UK, for example, they estimate that about 10% of heterosexual men are wearing co uh, cosmetics. And, you know, they, they have products like Manscara and Guy Liner. Uh, we're not wow. seeing this in the States as much, but, you know, to people I mean, who say, oh, that'll never come here. I say, yeah, you yeah. said that about a lot. You said that about the Beatles, too, but they came over from the UK. <laughs> I mean, you go down to Brazil. I spent almost four years down there. And sometimes the men are even more vain than the women. Yeah. You know, when you talk about they, they wear makeup, they wear and they don't even have to be bisexual or or anything like that. You know, it's just. It makes them feel good, you know, as far as that's concerned. But um, where where I was going with the male female is I'm thinking that every individual has a male female way of communicating of, of, you know, that's where I was going with that. And it might not be more on the marketing side, but it is when you think about it, because sales is part of marketing. And if you're interacting with your consumer and there may be times where that female may come out more than the male, depending on what that consumer is looking at. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's certainly true. And, you know, we often make assumptions. They're often, you know, they're stereotypes. They're not always true, but, you know, for example, you know, if you're a sales person, you, you stop me if I'm wrong, you're the expert on this. If I, you know, if there's a customer in a store and I don't know anything about them except their gender, I'm going to assume that the male is going to be more aggressive and ask more questions and things like that. Are there women who, who do that? Well, I, I go shopping with my wife. She does all that for me. But, but we, you know, uh, these expectations, if you start to, to treat someone as if they're a stereotypical male or female, right. and it turns out they're not, which is increasingly likely today, mm -hmm. you probably ruffle some feathers you didn't need to, to right. do. Right. Right. Um, one last question here. OK, you talk about the young shoppers and you talk about the hive mind. Talk about, you know, explain that. What's the hive mind? Yeah, the hive mind. Uh, well, for any of your your viewers who who are familiar with Star Trek, uh, I, that reference comes from there. There was a, uh, there, you know, the Borg. They were this they kind of what they did is they Connected just with the, the yeah. board people into this, you know, nexus and all, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, what I mean by the hive mind is that, you know, it's very interesting. We, we've done an enormous amount of research, my colleagues and, and I, you know, over 50, 60 years to understand how customers make decisions or how we make decisions more generally. And we've been pretty successful at identifying a series of steps that people go through and, and identifying what you need to do when your customers at each step. Those models are, are largely assume that the, each individual is, is a sole decision maker. And to a large extent, at least in some parts of that process, they're not influenced by what others say. We know today that those influences are enormous. I mean, social influences have always been, been big. But when you look today at, you know, uh, just anecdotally, you know, I, I have, I, you know, I, I see students who can't eat a meal at a nice place before they post photos of it on, Pinter on, on Instagram or, or, or Pinterest. Uh, what that means is that they're validating their choices. They're letting their, their networks, their BFFs, you know, all of these probably thousands of people, most of whom they've never met in person and never will, uh, these people are, are validating their choices. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that there's this constant back and forth. It's not just on demand, you know, oh, I want to buy a new outfit today. I'm going to ask my friend to go with me to the store. It's more like, you know, yeah, I've been thinking about buying this outfit and in my feed, you know, in my Instagram, I see all these pictures of people wearing job appropriate outfits. 
So there's all of this research that's going on even before the actual purchase is necessary. And there's, there tends to be a need for validation where when people buy something, they post it and they need to get feedback from others. Mm-hmm. And if that feedback is negative, then that outfit goes back to the store. So it's not so much an incremental kind of thing where, oh, gee, I have to, you know, I'm out of this. I need to buy this. I'm going to go through these steps, but more like this constant flow of information, this hive mind of, of people in your network that for whatever reason you, you trust their judgments, you know, half of them are probably corporations that are masquerading <laughs> as individuals, but whatever. Um, and so you're looking to them to really give you a lot of guidance about your decision making. Exactly, exactly. Well, this has been really fascinating, Michael. <laughs> Um, we're coming up on the end of another episode of Charged Up Studio. And Michael, do you have any last minute tips to impart to our listeners? Well, again, I say, you know, uh, put yourself in their shoes. Don't just sit in your office and try to imagine what your customers would like. Very good. Very good. And can you also let our listeners know how they can get a hold of you? Should they have any more questions or want to reach out? Sure, how can they reach you? Yeah, well, you can find me very easily at my website, which is just michaelsolomon.com. That's Solomon with three O's, dot com. Um, Email me, michael at michaelsolomon.com. And uh, the book that I mentioned, The New Chameleons, How to Connect with Consumers Who Defy Categorization, is available on Amazon or anywhere else you buy books. Okay, very good. So that's it, guys. I want to thank you all for joining us today and make sure you leave a review on whatever podcast delivery platform you're on today, or you can go to our Charged Up Studio Facebook page and leave a review. If you want to learn more about different topics associated with growing a successful business, please visit our online e-learning platform, marketatomy.academy. I look forward to talking with you again next week for another exciting episode where small businesses get charged up for success.